Lieutenant David Zerbus was born and raised in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. In 2006, he attended the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut, earning a Bachelor of Science degree in Management. He graduated from the Coast Guard Academy in 2010, receiving his commission as an officer in the Coast Guard. His first assignment was as a deck watch officer aboard the Coast Guard Cutter Laguerre, a 270-foot law enforcement ship stationed in Portsmouth, Virginia. Then from April 2012 to 2000, April 2013, he served as the executive officer aboard the Coast Guard Cutter ADAC, a 110-foot ship uh, stationed in Bahrain. During his time aboard the ADAC, he patrolled the Arabian Gulf and Strait of Hormuz in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. In July 2013, he took on the assignment of commanding officer of the Coast Guard Cutter Blackfin, which of course is right here uh, at the end of the Navy Pier, uh, the city pier in front of the Maritime Museum. Lieutenant Service will be a member of the Santa Barbara community uh, through July 2015 when he rotates out. So please join me in welcoming Lieutenant David Service. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm very impressed uh, Mr. Gord was able to uh, get my last name right, Zorbless. It's usually kind of tough to pronounce. Um, I want to say it's really uh, exciting for me to come here and uh, speak to you guys. I, I called this presentation The Force Unknown because I really feel like the, the average person doesn't know too much about what the Coast Guard actually does. They kind of see some things in movies and um, what they read about in the news, but a lot of the missions that we do are very varied and diverse, and I think a lot of them go unnoticed. So it's very exciting for me and a lot of fun to come and uh, share some of um, what we do as an agency and also some of my personal experiences uh, with all you guys. So thank you. Um, I was going to tell you guys a lot of elaborate, crazy stories to you know, get your imaginations going. Now I, I feel like we have a couple of former Coasties in the audience here, so they'll probably call me out, so I'll, I'll just stick to the facts. <laughs> so first thing that everybody thinks about the Coast Guard is, uh, like I said, what they see in the movies. Uh, the Guardian, we've got uh, Ashton Kutcher and Kevin Costner. They're always on call, ready to go out and uh, <laughs> save people. Um, but uh, really, uh, less than uh, half of 1% of people are actually rescue swimmers, actually do what they uh, portray in that movie. It's a great movie, but uh, I'm going to try to focus on some of the other things that we do. Uh, so first, talk a little bit about uh, Coast Guard history and uh, how we came to be the organization that we are today. So back in 1790 is when the Revenue Cutter Service was uh, first founded. Uh, it was founded by uh, then uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, so he's known as the, the father of the Coast Guard. And the purpose of the Revenue Cutter Service then uh, was just, uh, it was the first uh, armed uh, maritime service to protect our ports of just the nation coming up, building up. We didn't even have a Navy then. Uh, the Navy wasn't established officially until 1794. Uh, so it was just 10 cutters, or 10 ships, uh, that were employed to not only protect the ports, but also control commerce and all of our uh, uh, commercial and trade laws that they had back then. Uh, so the Coast Guard is actually the longest single standing armed maritime force. It was actually formed before the Navy, uh, which most people don't know. Then also in uh, 1878, the U.S. Life Saving Service was established. Uh, this is, you kind of see in uh, some old, old time books and movies of these uh, lifeboat stations that are all along the shore, kind of like lifeguards, but these guys would go out into heavy surf in just these little rowboats and go out and uh, get people, uh, save people that were uh, in distress, either swimmers or ships offshore that uh, were in distress. Uh, a lot of these people uh, risked their lives and a lot of them uh, actually perished uh, doing their duty. That's kind of where the, the unofficial motto of the Coast Guard was born. You have to go out, but you don't necessarily have to come back. And that was, that was their model for a lot of years. Uh, that's not the Coast Guard's motto today. We, uh, we take a lot more, uh, we take safety into account a lot more. But they were, they were definitely a bunch of gung-ho individuals. So then in 1915 is when uh, these two services joined together and combined to form uh, what we call the U.S. Coast Guard today. And then also uh, we took on the uh, light, Lighthouse Service, too, uh, in 1939 and took control of all the lighthouses and um, for years after that, we maintained the lighthouses, we had lighthouse keepers, and just maintained those aids to navigation for mariners. Uh, so, as I said, uh, Alexander Hamilton was the, the founder of the Coast Guard. He was uh, part of the, or the Coast Guard was part of the 
uh, Department of the Treasury. In 1967, they moved to the Department of Transportation. And then we moved again in 2003 to Department of Homeland Security. So we are one of the five armed branches of the military. Uh, what sets us apart from the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force is that they're all part of the Department of Defense. We're in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and this was a move that we made uh, post 9-11, and we started uh, really emphasizing more of the law enforcement mission and the security, port security mission uh, after 9-11. Just to give you a little snapshot of uh, the, all the personnel that we have in the Coast Guard, uh, 43,000 active duty members. Uh, that sounds like a lot, but when you think about how many coasts, how many miles of coastline they have to guard, uh, not just in the continental United States, but Alaska, Hawaii, and we even have stations overseas pretty much all throughout the world. Uh, just kind of put that number in perspective, that's about the size of the New York Police Department uh, that we have working for us. Uh, so that kind of brings up a theme that you see a lot in the Coast Guard, and that's doing more with less. So with the, uh, the amount of people that we have, you can't have people just specialize in one thing. They have to be kind of a jack of all trades and really perform a diverse array of, of missions. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, Rob, you want to raise your hand back there? One of the uh, crew members of the Blackfin, uh, he's a machinery technician, which means his primary job is to handle uh, all the machinery, all the equipment we have on board, maintain the engines. That's his primary job, but also he's one of our primary boarding team members, so he straps on a gun, goes on, on boats, and does all the law enforcement missions. He also drives a small boat, uh, which is something that's you know, completely out of his specialty. So that's just kind of one example of what you know, one person has to do. They have to perform a lot of different missions, which is something that you don't see in some of the other agencies. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, I'd like, statistic I'd like to bring up, uh, nearly 15% of active duty workforce made up of women. And historically, the Coast Guard has uh, been the, the favored uh, choice of women to join the military. We provide a lot of opportunities for women uh, that some of the other services may, maybe didn't have uh, for a while. Uh, we were actually the first service to accept uh, coast, uh, female officers. Uh, the Coast Guard Academy in 1975 accepted the first class of female cadets uh, to become commissioned officers in the Coast Guard. And recent classes of the Academy are graduating uh, close to 30%, so almost one in three uh, are female officers now. So there's uh, 11 official missions that the Coast Guard performs. Uh, like I said before, search and rescue is usually the, the number one uh, most easily recognizable one for everybody. Um, I'd like to point out a couple others here. You see uh, this red hull cutter. Uh, that means it's a polar icebreaker. So they'll go up and do Arctic patrols, and uh, their hulls are actually steel reinforced uh, and designed to break the ice. So they'll go up and just cut holes through the ice to allow the opening of shipping lanes during those long winter months. So that while they're doing that up there, we also have uh, these black hull cutters. Uh, they'll go out and they specialize in uh, maintaining aids to navigation. So all the buoys, channel markers, everything that uh, mariners need to safely navigate, they'll not only place them but maintain them and uh, you know, fix them when they're broken. And as you can see here in the corner here, this uh, also provides a good platform for seals to come up and do their sunbathing. So it, everyone's a winner in that case. Uh, but of these 11 Coast Guard missions, uh, the Blackfin right here in Santa Barbara performs actually all of them with the exception of uh, aids to navigation. We're just not set up for that. And uh, of course, like, hopefully we don't have to do ice operations here in Southern California. Uh, but the other nine, uh, the Blackfin is uh, capable of doing and does on a regular basis. So this just gives you a little snapshot of uh, the Los Angeles area. So the whole coastline is broken down into different sectors. Uh, we're part of Sector Los Angeles, Long Beach. Uh, and it stretches as far north as Morro Bay, just above Morro Bay, down to as far south as Laguna Beach. Uh, so it's a long area of coastline to, to guard, and it goes out 200 nautical miles out to sea. So in this entire area, we have uh, here in Santa Barbara, and then our three sister ships, the Black Tip, Halibut, and the south of us. Uh, between the four of us, uh, four of those boats, there will always be at least one of us either underway or on call to get underway in the event of any kind of emergency. And uh, oftentimes there will be more than one, one of us underway at a time. Then in addition to that, we have uh, three small boat stations. So one up in Morro Bay, uh, one in Oxnard, and then one in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, small boat stations, they're just uh, exactly what they sound like, smaller boats. They're uh, designed more for the quick emergency response to uh, search and rescue 
uh, cases that are, are close into shore. And they will always have a, a boat that's ready to go at a moment's notice. And then in addition to that, we have uh, an air station in uh, Los Angeles, uh, which has four helicopters, and at least one of those helicopters is always ready to go out and um, help mariners in distress. And all throughout, uh, we have the Rescue 21 system all throughout this whole AOR. This was uh, a system that was developed uh, about almost 10 years ago now, and it's really uh, revolutionized the way we do search and rescue. Uh, so for any sailors out here, you know, if you're in trouble, you, you get on the VHF channel 16 and you call for help for the Coast Guard. With uh, Rescue 21, uh, we have towers strategically placed all throughout the coastline and even on the islands uh, that relays that signal back to LA where we have our, our main command center. So no, ma no matter where you are along the coastline, if you call out on 16, the Coast Guard will be able to hear you. And not only will they be able to hear you, uh, they'll be able to uh, get a line of position to where you're calling from. So even if you can just, all you can get out before you go down is say mayday, we're in help, uh, you don't give out a position or anything like that, we'll still be able to uh, at least find a general area of where to look. So that, that Rescue 21 system has really revolutionized the way we do search and rescue. Just to give you a little uh, general information about the Blackfin, obviously we're home ported uh, right here in Santa Barbara, so you can go uh, take a look at us uh, afterward if you want. Uh, we're, it's an 87 foot patrol boat. Uh, we have 12 people on board. Uh, and that, that's a pretty tight space for 12 people. And uh, if you ever, uh, if you can imagine, the, the room, the rack space is very, very limited and uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to get much sleep on board because you're, you're in confined spaces and 87 feet is not a, a large ship for any kind of seas. So if we get any kind of uh, waves or swells, it's going to be very difficult for people to get any rest. Our typical patrols are three to four days. And I can tell you, after three to four days of no rest, uh, people are pretty uh, anxious to get home after that. Uh, but our primary missions, uh, as I said, we do, we do a, a wide array of them. But the primary one is uh, drug interdiction. If you've seen any of the news, uh, these panga boats coming up from Mexico, uh, right now that's our main focus, and really that's what we do most of our time. Uh, then also a migrant interdiction and uh, search and rescue. And then we do a lot with just uh, educating the general boating public on, on safety issues and doing inspections of recreational and fishing boats. But I'll get into uh, some a bit of the counter drug mission here. Uh, so we see uh, drugs coming up from uh, not just Mexico in this area, but a lot on the East Coast coming up from uh, all the countries in South and Central America. And these drug smugglers really use a wide array of different techniques to uh, make, get the drugs up into the U.S. Uh, so on the top there, that's a that's a typical go-fast vessel, and their strategy behind that is they'll just weigh that vessel down with as many uh, drugs as they can, and then they'll throw on as many engines as they can in the back and just go as fast as they can. Uh, so they're, they're very difficult to, to catch because they go so fast. A lot of times they'll be running at night, uh, so they're, they're tough to see. They're not lit. That's not a panga there, but uh, that just, that's actually a, uh, a go-fast coming up from Colombia. Uh, but pangas will do this, this similar uh, techniques. Then down here at the bottom, you see a, that's actually a semi-submersible. And they build these in the jungles of Colombia. Uh, and they're designed to go not quite under the water, but just on the water's edge. And usually they'll actually paint the top of them blue, so they blend in with the water. They're almost impossible to pick up on radar, and they're very difficult to see, even during the day. They'll weigh down um, the uh, semi-submersible with as much as uh, $90 million worth of cocaine in each trip that they make. And most of these are just designed to make one trip. So just, that gives you kind of a, uh, a perspective on you know, how much money these guys are making. They're willing to get rid of this entire sub submersible just on one trip because they're making so much. Uh, so it's actually became recently a, a law that uh, having operating one of these vehicles or one of these vessels is a felony because it's determined that the only possible use for it is to smuggle drugs. Uh, so what we were seeing in years past is if they got caught, they would just sink the vessel and all the evidence would go down with them. Now that's not the case. If they get caught, uh, we can still prosecute them. So these guys will make long trips. Um, the, after they drop off the drugs, they'll just sink the vessel and go ashore and um, try to head back down to wherever they came from and do it again next month. Uh, so it's pretty, uh, pretty difficult to, to combat, pretty difficult to anticipate their movements. Uh, but that's just what we train for, and it's, it's a constant battle. What we're also seeing uh, 
even more recently is uh, fishing boats and wreck boats bringing up these drugs in hidden compartments. So they'll actually you know, devise these hidden compartments or uh, false bulkheads and uh, store drugs in that way. So it's a lot of different uh, techniques that we're seeing and uh, a lot of different um, uh, adaptations that we have to make. We're constantly adapting to what we're seeing out there. So this is a picture of a, a Coast Guard helicopter uh, that actually has the capability of shooting uh, out a go-fast engines. Uh, so this is just a training evolution here, but here you can see they're practicing uh, doing warning shots to that, uh, that vessel right there. Uh, so we'll, we'll make every attempt we can to try to stop a vessel um, in a nonviolent way or a passive way. Uh, then we'll resort to, to warning shots, but if necessary, we'll be prepared to shoot out their engines, uh, which they can do from that helicopter. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible to imagine the accuracy that you have to have as a gunner on one of those helicopters shooting a moving target. Uh, those go fast typically go between 40 and 50 knots, uh, which uh, translates to about 50 to 70 miles per hour. Now I'll talk a little bit about the pangas that we're seeing here in Southern California. Uh, that's, that's a picture of a typical panga, and like I said, they have four engines on the back. Uh, they, they can go incredibly fast. So originally, we were just seeing these in, uh, coming up in San Diego because it was the closest spot to the border. Uh, but as our enforcement got so concentrated down there, they started coming farther and farther up north. And lately, we're seeing them go as far north as Morro Bay. And there have even been a couple of cases of them going as far north as San Francisco. Uh, this is an incredibly long trip to make in just a small vessel. And you can kind of get a, just a, an idea of the, the lack of equipment they have on board. They're not carrying any kind of electronics or navigation equipment. They don't have any safety equipment on board. Uh, and we really just don't know how many of them actually get lost at sea during these long trips that they make. Uh, but unfortunately, most of the, the drug runners are just, they're employed by a cartel in Mexico, and they're really not um, worth anything to the cartel. They're just a cost, extra cost of doing business. Uh, so they don't care if, if some of their employees die. Uh, but in fiscal year 2013, uh, we actually seized over 200,000 pounds of marijuana. And I can tell you already in this fiscal year, we've ex well exceeded that number. Uh, so they're directly linked to the Mexican cartels. And uh, we're seeing both drug smuggling and human trafficking bringing in migrants up from Mexico. Um, fortunately for us, in most cases, they haven't had weapons on board and they haven't shot at us. Uh, there have been cases on the East Coast in the Caribbean where they have shot back and we've gotten into firefights. Fortunately, we haven't had that here. Uh, however, back in 2012, uh, we did have one member, Senior Chief Terrell Horn, off the halibut was actually killed by a panga driver. Uh, you may have heard about it in the news. What happened in that case, uh, Senior Chief Horn was driving the small boat, uh, going to intercept the panga, and the panga driver decided he didn't want to be uh, caught, and he actually turned his boat into the into the Coast Guard bo boat and ran it over. Um, and he, he fortunately struck uh, Senior Chief Horn, killing him, and uh, injured uh, three of the other crew members. We did uh, catch these two individuals, and they went to trial for second degree murder. Uh, and the driver of the Panga actually did get, just get life in prison a few, minutes, uh, a few months ago. So up here in the top right corner, there's another picture of a Panga. And as you can see, once again, um, just very crude equipment that they have. Uh, they'll pack each uh, panga with up to 4,000 pounds of marijuana. Uh, and actually, this here in the left-hand corner, this is one of our seizures that we got, uh, was about 2,500 pounds. Uh, and that equates to uh, just over $2 million worth of street value. Uh, so primarily, we're seeing marijuana, but we do have a couple cases of, of cocaine coming up as well. The most common question that I get with people looking at the blackfin is, uh, what do the stickers mean on the side of the bridge? So these are all our drug busts that we've gotten. So we have currently 12 marijuana and uh, one cocaine. That's uh, what the cocaine means. Uh, nobody's really keeping track, but I will tell you, Blackfin does have the most of any unit in uh, Sector LA. So. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna play a quick uh, video here just to kind of show you some of the procedures that we go through to try to stop a, uh, a panga. All right, so this is, uh, this is a panga. This has actually happened last October just southwest of San Diego. Uh, this is at the start of the chase during the day, and it's actually going to uh, flip over to the end of the chase here in a little bit. Uh, so you see they're loaded down with marijuana, and they have two people on board. Here it is at night. Uh, you want to pause right there? Okay. 
So this is at night, uh, this is actually in, from an infrared camera. So you can see the heat signature of uh, everybody on board. We actually have two people that are running on board. This guy in the back is the driver, and the guy up forward, he looks like he's just hanging on for dear life during the chase, uh, but he actually has a job up there uh, to change out their fuel canisters if he runs out of fuel. Uh, so they'll bring these extra, extra buckets, 50-gallon um, drums worth of fuel, and if, if they run out, they'll just switch it out real quick so they can keep going. So that's his job during this whole chase. Uh, so at this point, uh, this uh, Coast Guard boat coming up, they've done everything they possibly can to try to get them to stop. They've yelled at them. They have their uh, uh, law enforcement light going. Uh, they've tried to hail them on a loud hailer on a radio in English and Spanish. Uh, at this point, these guys are not stopping. Uh, so we got two guys right here on the, uh, the back of the boat right here, and they're setting up with shotguns. And they're getting ready to, here, uh, pause it right there. So these guys, he's got a shotgun right now, and he's aiming right for these two engines. Uh, he's going to disable the engines. Uh, now, just to give you some perspective here, both of these vessels are going about 40 knots right now. Uh, so if you can imagine how difficult of a shot that is, he's, uh, he's moving pretty good in those seas, uh, so he's not on a stable platform at all. He's moving at about 50 miles an hour. The Peng is moving at 50 miles an hour. And that's a very small target he's got to hit in that engines. And uh, one thing that we always uh, take into account before we make the decision to fire is how close uh, people are to those engines. Um, you know, just despite the fact that they're drug runners, we don't want to hurt, we don't want to kill anybody if we don't have to, uh, obviously. Uh, so he's really got to be careful because that Panga driver is only a couple feet away from those engines. And you can actually see the muzzle fire of three shots right there. And three shots is all he took. He knocked out both engines. With a shotgun? With, with a shotgun, yep. <laughs> so right there, they're, uh, they got two guys uh, covering down uh, with weapons. Uh, they got the guys putting their hands up um, just in case they, one of them pulls out a weapon or something unexpected, and they're gonna, uh, about to go on board and, and take them into custody. So this just happened uh, last year, like I said, off of San Diego. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that the chases that we're seeing out there. Uh, fortunately, uh, since I've been on Blackman, we haven't had to fire at uh, any, any of the boats. They've all stopped um, after a lot of coercing. Yeah. So I can't give any specifics because it's part of an ongoing investigation. But I, I will tell you, our, our last uh, Panga bus that uh, the Blackman was able to get, uh, we were able to stop them after a lot of coercing. There was a little bit of a chase. Um, we finally did. Uh, get them to stop. They realized the, the game was kind of up. And uh, I was yelling at them in, in English to put their hands up and move to the front of the boat and all this. And I was just getting blank stares. Uh, so I figured, oh boy, this is going to be a, a tough one. Uh, then uh, we happened to have uh, one of our crew members, Jose Hernandez, who's fluent in Spanish up on the bridge. And he grabbed the microphone and yelled at him in Spanish. And they popped too right away. So <laughs> it, it helps having a Spanish speaker when um, you're dealing with some of these pangas. So I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the migrant op operations that we do here, too. Uh, this is actually uh, a Haitian sail freighter that's coming up uh, from Haiti. I, I'm not sure how many people are on board that, but uh, if any of you guys are, are sailors, you know how dangerous it is to overpack a vessel like that. Uh, these guys are wearing life jackets here only because the Coast Guard just gave them life jackets. <laughs> um, that's the first thing that we do. Anytime we encounter a vessel like this, we'll give them life jackets because most of them don't have them. Uh, so when we're trying to get them off board, a lot of them, you know, in, in the case that some of them fall overboard, uh, we might want to make sure that they don't drown. I encountered a, a vessel uh, very similar to this, almost identical to this. It was about a 70-foot vessel. It had uh, 86 Haitian migrants packed onto it. Uh, and it was a lot, they're primarily made up of uh, women and children. In fact, a couple of women that were nine months pregnant. Uh, we managed to get all the 86 migrants off safely on board our, our cutter, and just a couple hours after we did so, a storm came up and that vessel actually sank. And uh, they were about 90 miles from land when we found them. Uh, so a lot of times we'll see these migrant operations uh, turn into search and rescue operations because these guys will, um, you know, just go through drastic measures trying to get to the U.S. and really they take their own safety into, uh, they don't take their own safety into account a lot of times. I'll talk a little bit about a, a case that we had back in 2012, uh, right here up in Santa Cruz. Uh, we had a, uh, a case where a panga driver uh, brought up uh, 15 Mexican migrants. And just to give you a, a little bit of a perspective of the atrocious business practices some of these uh, panga drivers have and the cartel really has, um, 
they, uh, you know, they charge these people exorbitant prices, sometimes their life savings, just to get a, a boat ride up to the U.S. Uh, this one paying a driver decided he didn't want to get caught. He didn't want to risk going all the way to the mainland, so he dropped him off on Santa Cruz Island and told him it was the mainland. Uh, if you guys have ever been to Santa Cruz or been around the island, you know there's really nothing there. Uh, so these 15 people, again, women and children uh, were in the mix, uh, stayed on Santa Cruz Island for three days, uh, starving to death. Uh, the smuggler, uh, you know, obviously did not return. He headed back to Mexico. Uh, fortunately, one of them happened to have a satellite phone, and they couldn't hold out any longer, so they made a call for help. Uh, and the Blackfin was uh, tasked with going out to try to find them. And we did rescue them uh, just on the south side of the island uh, in a cave. And that's a, that's a picture from the view of the cave uh, coming in. Uh, so we were able to rescue these 15 migrants um, and get them the medical attention they needed right away. I'll go a little bit into the, uh, the search and rescue mission here. Uh, on a typical day, uh, the Coast Guard as a whole saves 11 lives. So it's, it's a mission that's always happening. It's always predominant. Pretty much anywhere you're stationed, you're going to be involved in some way in search and rescue operations. Uh, but they conduct uh, 66 cases a day, uh, save almost half a million dollars in property. And uh, that's, a, that's a good statistic, a good success rate that 84% uh, were actually successful in uh, saving. And these are a couple of statistics just from the Sector LA area. Uh, you can see just in uh, fiscal year 13, 319 cases. So that's almost a, not quite a case a day, but about five or six cases a week. Uh, so on a typical patrol when the Blackfin goes out, we can expect to get called away for a search and rescue case uh, at least once or twice. And so these cases will range from uh, just a, a flare sighting, somebody shoots up a flare, and we gotta go investigate it, to actually having a boat that's taking on water or a fire on a boat or something uh, really drastic. Oh, and this, uh, this picture here is uh, the picture of the Blackfin, as you can kind of see us uh, underneath all the water there. Uh, we're heading up uh, just over Point Conception. We're heading up to a search and rescue case. And you can't really tell, but those are 12-foot seas there. Uh, so you can imagine an 87-foot boat going head-on into 12-foot seas. Uh, it's it's pretty, uh, uh, a pretty crazy ride. Uh, in this case, uh, I will say it's a testament to the, the fortitude of the Blackfin's crew. They had just gotten done with a three-day uh, patrol where they hadn't gotten much rest. And uh, within a, an hour or two of getting back, we got recalled to go on this case. And uh, it lasted 36 hours for us. So this went well into the night. Uh, with those kind of seas, it's, it's impossible for anybody to sleep. And uh, typically, we mo do most of our work at night, but uh, we try to get rest whenever we can. And in this case, people just had to go without sleep to, to do the mission. Here's a few pictures of us uh, just training. We, always, we have uh, two uh, personnel on board that are trained as cutter swimmers. Uh, so we have here crewman uh, Derek Shank. He's about ready to go into the water there. Uh, and he's trained to. Uh, go get a, an unconscious or a conscious victim that's in the water and uh, you know, bring them to safety. So this is, a, this is a part of our routine training that we do on a, on a daily basis. Uh, here's a picture of uh, a gentleman, two of his children that uh, we actually were able to successfully rescue. They, uh, they got uh, disabled on their boat out in the middle of the ocean. Their engines died out. Um, we were able to get on scene and uh, get them off the boat and tow their boat back into Santa Barbara. So it was an excellent case. And, uh, you know, they were very, uh, very happy. They were right there on the mess deck uh, getting some snacks and water and recovering from being seasick. And uh, everybody that gets rescued by us gets a bumper sticker. Don't have it with me. It says, I was rescued by Coast Guard Cutter Blackfin. So, that's not a bumper sticker you want to get, if you can help it. I'll shift gears here and go a little bit into our uh, environmental protection mission. Uh, so the Channel Islands are a huge um, source of wildlife, and it's a national park out there. And uh, we work alongside NOAA and also uh, California Fish and Wildlife to uh, help enforce kind of the regulations that go into protecting the marine reserves out there. Uh, this gives you a little snapshot here of the uh, Channel Islands. All the red areas are marine reserves. So it's, a it's absolutely illegal for anybody to uh, fish or take any, any kind of living organism or disrupt the environment anyway in those, in those areas. Uh, it's becoming more and more of a predominant problem uh, that we find people fishing in the marine reserves. Sometimes it's a case of people not knowing where they are, uh, in which case we, we do a lot of work at educating the general public um, that are operating in this area. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of times uh, we find that the, the people, they know where they are and they just don't care. Uh, they figure they're not going to get caught and they'll actually take a lot of fish from the marine reserves. 
uh, both, both commercial fishermen and also just uh, recreational boaters. Uh, obviously, because these areas are not routinely fished, they're very plentiful um, in the fishing, in, uh, fishing supply. Uh, so they want to go there to get the fish, but uh, they don't really want to stick to the rules here. So this has become a, a huge part of our job where we'll go out there and, and board these boats and, and issue them fines if we find that they have been fishing inside the marine reserves. Here's a picture of uh, three of our crew members on a boarding, and right now they're actually um, uh, near the Marine Reserve uh, educating that captain on uh, the regulations that he, uh, he didn't know. Uh, but uh, this is one of our primary boarding officers, uh, MK3, Luke Shield. Uh, he's actually uh, conducting his 100th boarding. That's why we took a, a picture of it. Uh, but a 100th boarding that just this year, uh, which means he's been pretty busy. Uh, and he's just one of our, our boarding officers. So you can imagine how many boardings we do on a uh, regular basis. Kind of uh, some oddball missions that we do uh, is just a training, training missions with foreign navies, foreign coast guards, uh, just tr trying to get them uh, caught up on a lot of proficiency on the tasks that we do. In this case, we're doing an exercise with a, a Canadian naval ship. Uh, they came down from Canada to help with the counter drug mission uh, in this area. Uh, they don't get too many drugs up in Canada, so we kind of had to uh, train them a little bit in some of our procedures. So in this exercise, the Blackfin is actually pretending to be a fishing boat that's carrying drugs, and they're uh, doing a mock boarding of it. And that's just a picture of uh, two of the members of the Canadian Navy that were on the training team there. Another mission that is always, um, uh, we're always ready to do uh, is, is disaster relief. And anytime there's a natural disaster, or even a man-made disaster, uh, the Coast Guard is usually one of the first agencies that respond to it. Uh, so this just highlights a few of the most recent ones we've had, the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Coast Guard delivered 80 tons of supplies and food and uh, medical gear uh, to the disaster victims. Uh, also in 2005, Hurricane Katrina, uh, that was a huge endeavor for the Coast Guard. Uh, actually, Admiral Allen, who's uh, pictured there, he's kind of like the LeBron James of the Coast Guard. He's, he's done pretty much all of it. Uh, he took control of the whole Katrina response efforts uh, with the Coast Guard and FEMA and uh, the Coast Guard ended up saving uh, over 33,000 people or evacuating them. Uh, that's actually a picture of a, a Coast Guard helicopter picking up a, a person that was stranded off of their roof. Uh, and then in 2010, the Haiti earthquake, the Coast Guard was once again the first agency on scene. Uh, it provided uh, countless amounts of uh, manpower and supplies and medical attention to all the disaster victims. Uh, up here is a picture of uh, Coast Guard Petty Officer giving medical treatment to uh, one of the Haitian uh, victims. As uh, Mr. Gorga mentioned in my biography, uh, before coming here, I was stationed over in Bahrain, uh, over in the Arabian Gulf. I'll just uh, touch real briefly on uh, what we do out there. Most people don't know. Uh, we actually work for the Navy out there in guarding the uh, Iraqis' oil platform. So Iraq is uh, located right up here, and they have two oil platforms that account for 90% of their gross uh, GDP. Uh, so naturally these are high targets for terrorists and they've actually been targeted by terrorists in the past. Uh, so one of our primary missions out there was to guard these oil platforms uh, from potential threats. Uh, well, actually while I was over there uh, we were able to give that mission back to the Iraqis. So we, we were working on training them up and finally they, they got proficient enough uh, in being able to defend their platforms by themselves. Uh, so we did a lot of training work over there. Uh, we also did a lot of uh, humanitarian work with the local uh, fishermen. Uh, dow, little fishing dows would go out and they'd, they'd be fishing all over the place. And we actually had found from talking to them that they had problems uh, with the Iranian special forces coming out and pirating their vessels. Uh, they would come out at night and board their vessel and take any fish they had or any money or electronics and uh, sometimes put them at gunpoint. Uh, so they were actually uh, terrified of the Iranian forces out there. Uh, so a lot of what we did was kind of a humanitarian mission, providing them with extra medical supplies, stuff that they needed, and uh, also gathering information about uh, the activities that were going on. And there's actually uh, six Coast Guard cutters that are still stationed out there. They're 110-foot patrol, patrol boats, so a little bit larger than the Blackfin. Uh, there's a picture of two of them right there. And uh, this is actually a, a picture of one of the Iranian uh, Special Forces uh, boats that I was telling you about. Um, they'll, we, we encountered them on a numerous occasions, they would actually come pretty close to our vessels and they would 
pretend like they were going to come in to attack us or something, and that was just to kind of gauge our responses and gather intel on us. Uh, so for the most part, we knew they weren't going to attack, but it, it was still a pretty unnerving feeling having them come up with uh, their guns drawn on us. And then uh, this is uh, actually was my boat, the Coast Guard Cutter ADAC, uh, and they're flying a rather large flag, <laughs> disproportionately large, but we were, we were very proud of it. I think that's about all the time I have, but I'll uh, open it up to any, any questions. Uh, so you asked what we do with the Panga boats after they've been seized or, or captured. Uh, in a lot of cases, we find that uh, some of these abandoned Pangas are found by local fishermen or mariners that are just out and happen to see it. Uh, and in that case, a lot of times they'll claim their salvage rights, and um, after we conduct our investigation, they'll actually end up getting that, the vessel back or the engines, which are really valuable. Uh, in our case, uh, normally we use them for training. Uh, so we'll actually have, we actually have a couple pangas that we'll uh, take out and practice doing boardings on and practice shooting out their engines and stuff like that. So it's, it's a good training tool for us to be able to practice on as close to the real thing as you can get. Uh, Semi-submersibles, uh, looking at about uh, just under 100 feet usually. Um, interesting fact about that, I actually got to go on board one. Uh, they uh, typically carry uh, three people, two to three people. Uh, like I said before, they'll be stacked in with cocaine um, as much as they can carry. Uh, it has to be a very uncomfortable journey for them. There's absolutely no insulation between where they're driving the boat and the engines. Uh, so I'd imagine it gets very, very hot in there on top of the sun beating down on it all day. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how those guys are able to do those long trips in there, but uh, I'd imagine it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty hazardous. Yeah, so the blackfin um, and Patrol boats like it go uh, about 25 knots is our max speed, uh, which some pangas just can go faster than that, obviously. Uh, so we kind of do our best with that, but uh, the small boat stations, they have vessels that can go uh, a lot faster. Uh, so we'll count on their assistance too. And uh, of course we have helicopters up that can you know, keep up with them. <laughs> I think it's, um, they have us over there because uh, we're, we're good at, we're experienced at doing the law enforcement mission and doing boardings. And a lot of the, what the mission over there is to actually board and search some vessels. Uh, so they have us over there for the, kind of that experience and um, that uh, kind of corporate knowledge to, to bring to the, to the table. Uh, we're actually, the 110 foot patrol boats are very similar to the Navy uh, patrol boats that they have over there. Uh, the Navy ships are a little bit longer, about 150 feet, but they have the, about the same capabilities. Uh, so they're pretty, pretty interchangeable with uh, the missions that we can do. Well, we can, we can use a shotgun, we can use a M16 rifle as well. Um, it's pretty much just kind of the, the preference of the gunner. So in that video, you saw he got, the driver got pretty close to the vessel just to make it as easy a shot as possible. Um, the, the question was if uh, we're at all affiliated with the Icelandic uh, Coast Guard just because their boats are so similar to ours. Uh, not that I know of, but uh, I will say a lot of our uh, decommissioned ships, we actually sell to foreign navies and foreign Coast Guards and they'll actually end up using those, those ships. Uh, so the question is, uh, what, what's our success rate with catching the, the Panga boats? Uh, we uh, don't have accurate, uh, completely accurate numbers, um, of course, but we estimate it's about 20%, so about, about one in five that we, we catch. Uh, the Blackfin is, was commissioned in 2000, uh, so they've been hope ported uh, here since then for the last 14 years. Uh, before that, it was uh, an 82-foot vessel. Um, Coast Guard Academy was... Uh, uh, it was a good fit for me. It's, it's kind of, um, if you don't know, Coast Guard Academy is, is one of the uh, major service academies along with uh, Annapolis, West Point, and the Air Force Academy. Uh, so basically they breed uh, Coast Guard officers. You go there for four years and, and get your commission. Um, the Coast Guard was a good fit for me because it was a, it's a smaller school. Obviously we're a smaller service. And uh, actually I wanted to play football in college. And um, you know, I wasn't big enough to play in any of the Division I schools, but the Coast Guard was a good fit for me there. So I was still able to play. Right, so those, those volunteers are uh, auxiliaries. So anybody can, can join the Coast Guard Auxiliary. A lot of them just have their own personal boats uh, that they'll go out and, and help with any mission that they can. And it's a huge help for us. Like I said, we're, we're very always spread thin with um, our budget constraints and the number of personnel we have. Uh, so these guys provide a, a huge asset for us, whether it's helping out with a search and rescue case or helping uh, to uh, enforce a a uh, safety zone over you know, an event that we have or anything like that. So we rely a lot on the volunteers that we have. And most of them are just uh, regular people that happen to have a boat and want to help out. And that's all we have. Thanks a lot. Sure thing. We appreciate the hand for David. Let's all hear a hand for the Blackman crew, too.